Hi everybody, this is probably going to be one of the longest and most complicated videos that I've put up, so um, please be patient because I think that there's something uh, valuable that I figured out and I want to explain it in as much detail as I can. Um, one of the problems, the advantages and disadvantages of digital painting is that you always have access to all of the brightest colors in the world all the time. When you go to your color picker in Photoshop, you've got this RGB spectrum to choose from. You can choose every color at however saturated you want it, and you can paint with it, which is great because, you know, you don't have to worry about using some expensive blue and then using it all up. You have unlimited color, and you have pretty much every color that you can um, create within the RGB gamut, which is quite a few. One problem with this is the fact that not all colors look good together and it when you have too many bright colors they start to fight with each other and you end up with this issue that I call Crayola-itis where you're using all these really intensely saturated colors all together and they start just swearing at each other um, and you lose color harmony because you've got the entire gamut of the entire RGB spectrum in one composition. It's just, it's just overwhelming. When you're out in the real world, there is usually a limitation to the number of colors you see at any given time. Like right now, it's overcast. I'm looking out the window, and I see a lot of gray. I see a little bit of red from some, some leaves on trees and from some bricks and a building across the street. But I'm not seeing any hot aquas I'm not seeing any bright magentas. I'm not seeing any uh, lime green like in here. So if I were going to paint this scene that I'm seeing out my window digitally, if I were to, to, if I were to paint it with real paint, I'd probably limit myself by picking a few colors um, from paint tubes and laying them out and limiting myself to only those colors. It is surprisingly difficult to limit your, your gamut in Photoshop. Um, a lot of people don't have this issue. They just go ahead and they paint and they don't worry about it. They just have a natural understanding of how to keep their color under control. I don't. I'm terrible at this. So what I've been looking for is a way to artificially constrain the colors that I have to work with in Photoshop. Now, a lot of digital painters, people you see posting speed paints and stuff like that, um, will you'll see that that in one corner of their of their canvas they'll have little blobs of color, and they color pick from that to keep everything unified. Um, and some people are very good at that, but I'm not. What I want is the equivalent of laying out a palette with only specific colors and only being able to mix between those colors and nothing else. So it's taken me a long time, but I think I figured it out. Just for some background information, there is an excellent book by James Gurney called Color and Light, where he talks about taking a color wheel and thinking about working within a limited gamut inside that color wheel. So if you have this spectrum here, where you have the, the most intense or highest chroma colors around in a ring around the outside and they gradually get toward gray, less chroma in the center, you, you say, well, I want only the colors in, let's say, this triangle to, I only want to be able to use these colors. Um, when you're mixing paint, that becomes very simple. You you mix this color, you mix this color, and you mix this color, and then you start mixing them together, and you have constrained yourself to only what exists in this triangle. Um, and if you're using Photoshop, it is possible to do that, but you have to do it in a slightly different way. So, let's say that I want to work with um, I don't want to work with the most intense colors. I want to 
work with a slightly neutralized palette. Um, I want the yellow to be very intense, but I want the magenta or the red to be less intense, and I want the the blue to be to be very very neutral. So let's just take a look on a color wheel and see what that would look like. All right, so that's going to give a kind of a warm autumnal palette and that's what I want to work with. So what do I do? In a new Photoshop document, um, I've created this document. There's a background layer. It's there. You can just leave it there. I've created a new layer on top of it. And now I'm going to take the marquee tool and it's the elliptical marquee. I'm going to hold shift and drag out to select a circular area. Now I'm going to go to my color picker and I can either color pick right from a color wheel, that's fine, but um, I can also just think about where I want my colors to be. All right, so I'm going to pretty much lay out a red, a yellow, and a blue, the three so-called primary colors. But the red, yellow, and blue are going to be a little bit different from the most stereotypical concept of what red, yellow, and blue look like. And what that's going to do is shift the palette in one direction or another. And um, in that book, Color and Light, there's a great explanation of that. But, okay, so first I'm going to pick my yellow. And I want kind of a kind of a lemon yellow. And this is going to be a pretty intense yellow. All right. I'm going to fill that circular selection with yellow. I'm going to make a new layer. I'm still selecting the circular area because I'm going to fill another circle. This time I'm going to fill the red or the magenta. This one is not going to be as intense. I'm going to turn down the saturation a bit. I'm going to select a kind of a rosy pink and I'm going to fill that. The yellow circle is under directly underneath it but you can't see it. All right, now finally, I'm going to make a new layer, and I'm going to choose the blue. The blue is going to be so, so neutral that it might as well be gray. I'm going to pick, it's, it's going to be a really, really low chroma. So uh, I've got that. I'm going to fill it. And that's what that's what's going to pass for blue in this limited palette. All right, now, when you want Photoshop to blend colors as though they were paint, you have to use a multiply blend mode. Um, for reasons that I do not understand at all. All I know is that when you want two colors to blend as if they were like paint, you use the multiply blend mode or you can use the multiply brush mode if you're um, painting directly. So I've got these three layers and I'm going to separate out these circles to make kind of a little Venn diagram. I want them to overlap as much as possible so that I can see where I have a nice good area where each of them intersects. All right, so now that I have these three circles, I'm going to turn off the background layer. So these are against a transparent background. I'm going to select all, and then I'm going to do edit, copy, merged, or you can do control shift C, and then finally paste. What that did is it, um, copy the, the composite of all of these layers on top of each other and merge them into one when I pasted, which is good because now what I can do with this combined three circle diagram is take a blending tool and um, that you can see how I made the blending tool in my uh, in my watercolor tutorial and I'm going to start blending the edges where each of these circles intersects the others. And that's going to give me a nice range of intermediate colors where each color meets the others. And you don't want to blend these things completely, completely, because you still want to have decent regions of pure color to choose from, but it helps to get a nice range of intermediate tones or colors. All right, so. I've 
muddied this up a little bit. I'm going to go back to my marquee tool. I'm going to select a new circle and I'm going to try to capture the center of this arrangement here. That's about the center. I'm going to go over to my layer palette and I'm going to hit the mask button. And now this, this layer is masked. So now what I have is a modified color wheel. It has a red, a yellow, and a blue, but the, that red, yellow, and blue are shifted in one direction, and I've excluded a whole bunch of colors. What I can do now, I can throw away the circles that I made to start with, because I don't need them anymore. Once I have this limited color palette, I'm going to want to start making some swatches. And what I'm going to want is swatches, preferably from as wide an array of values as I can get. That is to say, all right, I want this yellow, but I want that yellow as light as I can get it and as dark as I can get it. I want a really, really light pastel yellow, and I want a really, really dark, almost brown or green yellow. Um, but this color palette, this color wheel as I have it now, only shows just the whatever values are from the original multiply. So what I'm going to do is create an adjustment layer. I have a hue saturation adjustment layer. And uh, with that here, and I'm going to press this button, this is, uh, if you click this, it only affects the layer that it's directly above. So if I have anything in the background, it won't be affected. Now I can drag this to be lighter if I want a really pale pastel uh, yellow. So I'm going to make a new swatch here. And then I can drag this also to be very dark. So I want to select this yellow. And pretty much everywhere in between. I can make a nice um, series of steps for all the colors I want. And where this really starts to, to become pretty is when you start selecting from the blended colors in the center. So start getting these. These are these are going to be the very most intense, the most saturated, the highest chroma. And then as you um, fade in and out with your hue and adjustment, uh, your hue and saturation adjustment, you start getting these lighter ones and darker ones. It also, but it also neutralizes them because it is effectively blending them with white. So if you know anything about color theory, you know about tints and shades. That's what this adjustment layer is doing. You have a, a color wheel, and then you've got all the tints and the shades. So those are some light ones. And then drag and make some darker ones. At a certain point, what I like to do is to turn the background back on and fill it with 50% gray because um, it can get a little bit difficult to see how light or dark some of these things are against the transparency. That A lot of this uh, is based on contrast. so. If I want to start getting some darks, I want to be able to see exactly how dark they are against a neutral background. But I'm just making some more swatches here. Let's see, get that even darker. There's a nice green. Some blues, some purples. Oh. 
and let's get some even lighter lights. I'm going to erase this here. So the, you don't, you, you can lay these out in more methodical, intelligent way that I'm doing. I'm just putting them any old place, kind of roughly in a circle. Um, you can do like what I've done up here in the yellow and make make a step scale for everything, but um, I find it to be a little bit more spontaneous to just have these here and pick from them. Then when you when you start painting, you can blend them a little bit more. So this is what you end up here with here is um, a really nice array of colors to choose from, which are all connected to each other. Um, the gamut of this composition is going to be limited and that's going to create a whole lot of color harmony it's going to be very pretty so i can show you some of the um some of the other experiments i've done the amazing thing about doing this is the fact that um you can pick some really really weird choices for this red yellow and blue you can have red be orange, you could have red be pink, you can have red practically be purple, you can have the blue be green, you can have uh, the yellow be gray. I mean, you, it's, it doesn't really matter what you do. Like, for example, one of my favorite limited palettes is the Zorn palette um, created by Andrew Zorn, and that palette is vermilion, yellow ochre, black, and white. So if you were to lay that out, you've got yellow ochre as your yellow and vermilion as your red, but what's your blue? Well, there is no blue, so you can make your blue be gray. And I did that. This, here's, here's an experiment I did earlier where you can see here's my little color triad here. I've got the kind of low chroma yellow, yellow ochre color here. I've got very, very bright cat red vermilion color here. I've got 50% or slightly lighter gray in here. And then everything that is mixed in. And look at all the swatches that I was able to get from that. Here's a little still life. Um, it's a study from a photo that I did from this just with these colors. And it um, makes life a lot easier. And then I'll show you some other ones that I did. Um, Here's one where the yellow is a lemon yellow, the red is a very coral pink, and the blue is like a, a, a turquoise. And here are all of the swatches that I got from that. And here's a study, another study from a photo I did, which um, keeps all of the colors related to each other. Nothing really jumps out as clashing horribly because the gamut is restricted. And then finally, here's here's the first one that I did um, with the red being red, the yellow being green, and the blue being kind of a purple. And here's a little sketch I did with these colors, um, um, palm tree. So what you can do with this is you can experiment a lot. You can uh, mess around with colors that you wouldn't think would work together. And as long as you keep your colors controlled, um, you can make things that are actually really pretty. Let me see, and then there was one other one that I made, which was, uh, this is um, actually a four color palette with uh, a burnt sienna and a burnt umber uh, and a yellow and a blue to see what it would be like to have some earth tones mixed in there too. And you can see here are all of the swatches that came out of that, and they all have a very nice harmonious relationship with each other. So um, this is something I've been really trying to figure out. I hope that it's helpful for other people. I know that not everybody needs to go to this length to constrain themselves, but I really do. So um, let me know if you have any questions about this. I hope that it makes sense. And uh, if you have any requests for other types of tutorials you'd like to see, I'm always open to taking requests. And thank you a lot for watching.